welcome to the Sin City Social Club Halloween party. We're excited that you're here. If you, this is your first time joining us, boy, are you in for some weird stuff. We're going, we have quite a few people who are going to be presenting and sharing today, but for now, I'm going to throw it over to Sid, who's about to reveal his costume. Hi guys, I'm really glad you all made it to the Halloween party. Um, I'm gonna, I've, I've been asking people to be really brave a lot of the time and I never, seem to do it myself. So I am going to sing you a song, a cappella, um, because I haven't got any technology to put any music to it. And that way I can pick my own key. Um, so here you go. It's a god awful small affair to the girl with the mousy hair, but her mommy is yelling no, and her daddy has told her to go. But her friend is nowhere to be seen. Now she walks through her sunken dream to the seat with the clearest view. And she's hooked to the silver screen. But the film is a saddening bore for she's lived it 10 times or more. She could spit in the eyes of fools as they ask her to focus on sailors fighting in the dance hall. Oh man, look at those cavemen go. It's the freakiest show. Take a look at the lawman beating up the wrong guy. Oh man, wonder if he'll ever know. He's in the best-selling show. Is there life on Mars? It's on America's tortured brow that Mickey Mouse has grown up a cow. Now the workers have struck for fame cause Lennon's on sale again. See their mice in their million hordes from Ibiza to the Norfolk broads. Rule Britannia is out of bounds to my mother, my dog and clowns. But the film is a saddening bore cause I wrote it 10 times or more. It's about to be writ again as I ask you to focus on sailors fighting in the dance hall. Oh man, look at those cavemen go. It's the freakiest show. Beating, take a look at the lawman beating up the wrong guy. Oh man, wonder if he'll ever know. He's in the best-selling show. Is there life on Mars? Great, that's my song over. Pretty relevant right now. Pretty Fantastic. relevant. Pretty impressive. Jump off the page because um, we seem to be on Mars sometimes. Diddig played guitar. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, I'm Stabby Garak. <laughs> oh yeah. Hello. Um, yeah, I'm also Garak. Um, the, these sleeves are actually um, from a dress that was custom made for my mom in the 90s. I am going as Bones from the original series. Uh, I've, got, I've got my communicator and, of course, my 3D printed phaser that took three months to sand down. Me and my dad worked very hard all summer on it. I am a flapper. And I'm drinking bathtub Diet Coke. I'm Ingerka Tamarana from the brand new show within La Pianca. Uh, it's on YouTube and it's very interesting and funny and I have a it's nice time. Right. It's fantastic. <laughs> this is printer paper and I gave the Dread Pirate Roberts a red lip and no one can do anything about it. I'm, I figured someone named Alexander should show up. So <laughs> I'm, shout out to Uncle Malcolm. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> more beautiful it's, a, it's the matt fraction comics version of hawkeye <laughs> and i actually learned how to shoot left-handed to do it yes hi i'm a mirror universe picard uh, it, from the id hmm? you made it so i made it so uh, actually my friend uh, sailor uh, marjorie munoz sewed the document so i have her to thank I'm just Slash, and it's Dina, by the way, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to correct people, but just things I had lying around my house and my husband's guitar, so threw it together. <laughs> uh, classic Scarlet Witch comic version. 
made the costume myself, wore it a couple, to a couple of uh, Dragon Cons, and yeah, Scarlet it's Witch. Beautiful. It's just amazing. It's gorgeous. <laughs> oh, <laughs> fantastic. So I'm a <laughs> random Ferengi engineer. What about you, Evie? And I'm a vampiress. Iftar has Smuzma, or Live Long and Prosper. Um, <laughs> I made this costume myself um, uh, when I got home from work this every day this summer, and I've made this triple this triple out of an old mink coat. So I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I am. It is adequate to be here. You look dispassionately so. Thank you. I'm obsessed with uh, Hamlet. So this is my interpretation of Ophelia's weedy trophies. Oh yeah, you know, yeah. The water, I feel like these look like water droplets. Um, yeah, and I made it myself, like for a, a few years ago, I was Ophelia at a, we, my friends and I went as dead literary heroines. So I went as Ophelia that year. Ophelia's such an appropriate thing for Halloween. We've got a spooky story on deck. Oh, good. And it's, with a special guest who has limited time. So we're gonna go over to Nana. I should so say hi, hi because I've got my uh, camera off. Oh yes, that's much better, my <laughs> Fantastic. Finally, <laughs> Bowie, there you are. <laughs> I finally made it. Yes. <laughs> it took me I was 54 and a half, 55 years old nearly, but I made it. You made it, it doesn't yeah. matter. No, Good. I'm very happy. And now I'm gonna let you read because I love, I love to listen. Well, I'm actually not going to read. I'm actually going to tell you a ghost story from my own life. Oh, wow. Brilliant. Okay. When I was nine years old, my mother was taking me back from school to home in Manhattan, and we passed a newspaper stand, and something horrible had happened at, uh, at a house that we knew very well. Um, it was called Rough Point, and uh, it was on the front of the newspaper. My mother was friends with Doris Duke, a tobacco heiress who at the time was one of the richest women in the world. She had inherited it from her father, who at one time had uh, really a monopoly on all the tobacco in America. And she and my mother were very good friends. They had fallen out. My mother at the time when we passed that newspaper, uh, they weren't speaking. But Doris had hit and killed Eduardo. And Eduardo was another family friend. It was Doris's dear friend and decorator. He decorated all five of her homes all over the world. and. He was this vivacious, vibrant, wonderful. Uh, it, it was a new way of decorating houses. It was Big Sur. He took us there. When I was five was my first experience with Big Sur. He was style and grace. And my mother at the time thought Doris was a little bit in love with him, um, which may have been hard for her because he was gay. And, uh, Evidently what happened, let me just tell you about Rough Point. Rough Point, if you've ever read uh, Daphne du Maurier's uh, book, Rebecca, or seen the movie, when they talk about Mandalay, this is what Rough Point was like, just a little bit more. Uh, it was in Newport, Rhode Island, and it was right at this, it was just cliffs and very, very rough water, all rocky right beneath it. And it was classic. You'd hear the fog horns go off, da da, all night long. And the winds whipping from the sea, right on the cliff. Um, we had visited there and it was a creepy, there'd been more than one death there. There was a maid that I remember very well. I had to be four years old, her name was Julia. And uh, she, my, my, one of my, it's one of my earliest memories, uh, waking from a nap and seeing my mother and Doris walking by the cliffside and wanting to go down to them and Julia stopping me and saying, no, dear, no, no, dear, you're going to stay with me. 
she was found and you can, this is all documented. She was found, she had been sunbathing on the rocks and she was killed that way by a rogue wave. And there were other deaths at Rough Point. And what was on the cover of the newspaper that shocked my mother so much that she got in touch with Doris again, was that uh, there had been a malfunction at the electric gates. And Doris asked Eduardo to open it manually. He did, and she ran him over. He was doubled under the car and she went mad for a while. Um, my mother got in touch with her. She felt very huge compassion and um, they were friends again. Cut to 15, I'm 15 now. And my mother had been encouraging, my mother was a very confrontational, confront your fears, confront what bothers you. And she had convinced Doris to open Rough Point up again because the house had been closed since the death. She never went there uh, for all those years. And Doris decided to, and it involved redecorating and there was a wing of the house. So it was uh, the bedroom wing upstairs in the second floor was my mother's bedroom. It was called the Nanette room because she had encouraged Doris to reopen it. And then a bedroom here, it's like kind of forming three sides of a cross, a bedroom here, which faced the ocean and a bedroom on the other side. I probably need to mention that my sister, uh, soon after Eduardo's death, started saying that she was having visitations from him. And it went on for a long time. I remember some of it, but it's not my story. I'll just say that an exorcist was hired, who was actually a guy who worked at a candy counter in a, in a, in a movie theater at the time. Um, but he was also an exorcist. And after his visit, um, there was no more trouble. So my sister, which, so we're invited to Rough Point when I'm 15. My sister didn't wanna go. We were invited for the week. My mother and I went for the entire week. My father and my sister were coming for the weekend um, because my sister really didn't want to do this visit at all. Um, the week went by, it was amazing. I, I read Rebecca a million times and dreamt of Mandalay and I'm 15 years old. And you know, this, it's, it's a very Gothic mansion. Mansion, not in terms of what we call them now, but the real deal. I remember a fireplace in one of the main rooms that I could stand straight up in. Um, it was with, with coats of armor and, and flags. It was a bizarre kind of house. Um, nothing happened. Just one rough moment that I remember all three of us felt rough about, Doris, my mother and me. Uh, we decided to go out one day for the movies. It was the only time we left the house. And uh, as my as Doris pulled up, uh, my mother didn't drive, Doris pulled up to the gate and it malfunctioned. And I, all three of us felt the tension, but my mother got out and opened the gate and everything was fine and we saw the movie. So I was annoyed with my sister. I felt that she was being a fraidy cat. And, uh, and I was feeling very brave. My sister's older than I am, six years. And I was feeling very brave and nothing had happened. And I'd had a fabulous time being tragic, walking along the cliffs of Rough Point. <laughs> that night, the night she arrived, um, we all went to bed my parents to the Nanette room. I was, I chose the best room uh, besides the Nanette room, which had the view of the ocean. And there were um, it, French doors, about six sets of French doors opening in to the, uh, with, a, with a latch opening into the room, which was incredible at night. 
and my sister was in the room opposite me. Um, I laid down and I, there was no breeze that night, which was a little unusual, but there wasn't. I just laid down and I hear you know, backless slippers, flap, 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 going towards the doors. And I move my head and there's no one there. And starting from the left side of the room, flap, 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 dun, 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 dun trying the door. Flap, flap, dun, 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 trying the next door. Each door handle was being roughly tried as if to see that it was locked. I didn't move. I was frozen at this time. And all six doors were tried. And then the flapping slippers started going out the door and what I believed going towards my sister. Uh, and I screamed. I screamed to get myself out of the fright. I screamed to make whatever it was go away. I screamed to alert the house. My parents and my sister came running and I got into a hell of a lot of trouble because my parents accused me of trying to scare Zen because they knew that I wasn't buying any of this. And I did, I scared Zen very badly. Um, and there was nothing I could do to convince my parents that this had happened. So now we go to about a year, a year and a half later, we are visiting Doris, all four of us, at her Somerville uh, mansion. It was called The Farm. And we're having lunch, which is, you know, basically the children were expected to never, ever, ever speak. We didn't speak. It was a conversation between my parents and Doris and Doris always took the lead. And if she spoke to you, it was a very special thing. Um, but it, there was no conversation with me. It was between my mother and Doris and Doris asked my mother, do you remember that housekeeper I had? And my mother said, which, what housekeeper? She said, you know, the, the one, it was years ago, she was at Rough Point. My mother said, no, I really don't. And she said, yes, yes. She took pills, she killed herself at Rough Point. You know, she always wore those flapping slippers. That's my story. Wow. Wow, that is properly scary. <laughs> That's fantastic, Nana. No idea what that was or what it meant or if I picked up a story from that I heard, but that's... And really, if you look up Rough Point, I think you can find pictures of it. It'll really give you the feel yeah. of, of, of that time. It, was, it is an incredible house in Newport. I believe you can visit it. Do you remember when you were buying a, buying a house in, in Cedarhurst in Las Feliz? Yes. Uh, and we looked at the house on the same street, a, a, few a couple of houses down. And we, you, I remember you going into one of the rooms upstairs and saying, <gasps> yes. we can't buy this house. We can't buy this house. There's something wrong. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. We didn't. Yeah. I, I, certainly, I certainly got sensitized. I don't know. I don't know what I think about any of it. I'm sure there's some kind of interesting neuroscientific reason for all of it, but um, I, I do know that, that that's exactly what happened. Well, that is the perfect Halloween story. <laughs> <laughs> well, love to all of you and happy Thank Halloween. you. Thank you, Nana. Thanks for coming by. You bet, my pleasure. <laughs> oh, that gave me the shivers. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's true, that story. That flap, flap, flap noise is creepy on its own. Yeah. Ugh. She oh. has more, There's, she's had other encounters. That's Hello. So. Hello. Sandy Claus is here and also in half Taekwondo uniform because I have to teach after this. And so I've got oh, no. like oh, 10 minutes after this meeting to get out of this. Oh my goodness, you're gonna make it. You're gonna make it. Or you don't. I you have to. <laughs> You make them laugh and then you whop their asses for them. <laughs> <laughs> you look great. That's really fantastic. Thanks for making the effort. Oh, right. wow. Pretty creepy, Emma. 
good. That's what I was going for. Wow, that's <laughs> I am, I'm not sure what this is. I think it's like a necromancer or something. I don't know. It, I just wanted to make this weird headdress. It's so really it. cool. It's it's like um like one of those Teutonic mythic Norns, the Fates. Do you know those? The, the, they yeah, can't yeah. see. Yeah, you look like a Norn. Excellent. <laughs> Pretty wonderful. You can, yeah, you look, it weighs a ton because I've just stuck a bunch of broken jewelry on it so inevitably i'm going to get bored and take it off and we'll do that something else but do that immediately, immediately we finish talking take it off and get comfortable <laughs> but it looks fantastic i'm tana talon would you like to introduce yourself yes i am first Cantana to one at the uh, db patrol mw4 wow that is awesome I'll show you with me yeah great that is fantastic with a ballet and Awesomeness all over the place. Atleth Kartakin. All right, we've got Ensign Bradward Boimler. There you is. Hi. Hi. I didn't realize I was in a movie. I'm yeah. a Bradward. <laughs> and I made this uh, last night. <laughs> it's so good. You made it last hair. night. And it's your kind hair of is fantastic. But it is, yeah. I promise it is purple. Wow. It's awesome. Jackie. Hi. Hi. I'm Tendi, also from Lower Decks. It's not completely finished because I couldn't, there are shoulder parts that are supposed to be pointy and I couldn't figure them out, unfortunately. But uh, <laughs> it looks pretty great. If you hadn't told me that, I wouldn't, <laughs> I would not have. Now I'm obsessing about the fact the shoulders aren't pointy, but you know, before, yeah. right along with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Hi. It, uh, before you smiled, it really is creepy. And now <laughs> you're smiling. It's great. <laughs> wow. I couldn't decide if I would be a vampire or a deadly clown. So I'm a vampire clown. It's Hi. really good at that. It's wonderful. All right, folks, we're going to do a little history lesson real quick. Um, Shar, our resident professional haunter, is going to tell us a little bit about the history of Halloween. Uh, my name is Char Mayer, and uh, like she said, I'm a haunter, and I've been working in the haunted house industry as a professional monster for about 45 years. So Halloween is kind of my thing. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the origins of Halloween. So like most holidays, uh, Halloween changed over the years, and it's kind of a mixture of a few different holidays um, to bring together what the Halloween we know today. It started way back about 2000 years ago with a three day fire festival. And this was celebrated by the Celtic people. It was a holiday called Samhain and it's, pronounced, it's spelled S-A-M-H-A-I-N. And uh, it took place in England, Ireland and Scotland. And November 1st was their new year. And they believed on a six month calendar. So you'd have summer and winter, light and darkness. And Samhain actually means summer's end. So this would be a day of celebration where the veil between the living and the dead would be very weak. And they believe that the dead can return to the earth. They would invite the dead into their homes and they would wear costumes and masks just in case they got evil spirits. And their costumes were animals. They would wear animals skins and make masks. They would cook for the dead, um, but they would end up giving, of course, the food to people that were either the poor or the hungry in their area. Um, this is also a time where people did a lot of mischief. People played tricks on other people and they would blame the dead. It was also a lot of big bonfires to celebrate and the bonfires honored the dead and protected the living. They would share the embers of the bonfires um, to all the people and they would have their New Year's fires and that would be something they kept over the year. Now we move on to uh, the Romans take the Celtic lands. This was four, uh, 43 AD, about 400 years uh, they blended their holidays together, and the, uh, the holidays that the Romans brought was called uh, Pomona, Pomona Day. It was November 1st, and Pomona was the goddess of fruits and gardens, and they had, uh, her symbol was apples, and they did apple bobbing, 
and they would take the apples out and skin the apples, throw the apples over their shoulders and look at the shape of the apple skins and that would form whatever letter they would see and that would be the person that they were gonna marry. So we already see apples and, and bobbing and costumes and giving food out and tricks all starting to come together. Now, ninth century, Christianity spreads through Europe and the Celtic lands and in eight, 35, uh, November 1st, they have a Catholic festival that's called All Saints Day. It's also called Hollows Mass, and from Hollows Mass, they get the day before with the eve of it. So it's Eve, Hollows Eve, and then eventually Halloween. And this was a holiday that celebrated saints. A couple of years later, the church made another holiday on November 2nd, which was All Souls Day. And that was the holiday to celebrate and honor the dead. Also celebrated with bonfires and parades, and they would dress up as saints, uh, angels, and devils. Now coming to America, the Puritans did not bring those holidays with them, but they did have fall festival. And in the late 1800s, with the potato famine in Ireland, the Irish migration did bring the beginnings of Halloween to the United States. By the 1930s, we saw Halloween become a non-religious holiday and also a commercial holiday because this was the time where you could actually buy decorations and pre-made costumes at the stores. Into the 1950s, it was celebrated with scary movie festivals. They would have double features and they call them horror shows. You'd get one scary movie and in between Queen. They'd have people with masks on running through and they would scare people and then they put on the second movie. In the 1960s, TVs would air Halloween specials as it continued to grow as a holiday throughout the United States and through the world. It's grown into what we celebrate now. It's become the second biggest money spending holiday in, uh, in uh, the amount of money that people spend uh, Last year, there was almost $9 billion spent worldwide. And uh, we celebrate now with trick-or-treating, holiday parades, uh, haunts, yay. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, even Halloween parties. And uh, this is the first year we're doing something new to Halloween and we're adding our virtual Halloween parties. <laughs> so that brings our Halloween presentation right up to today. Shah, that's fascinating. I couldn't, I can't thank you enough. That's really interesting. I've never even, I've never known any of that. It's just wonderful. Oh, thank, you. thank you very much. No idea. I didn't get to tell you my costume. My costume is uh, based on Jolly Jane, who is a serial murderer. And uh, I actually am doing a show right now. And after this, tonight, I have to go do this, <laughs> do my wow. serial murdering. <laughs> Um, oh wow that's my halloween costume oh well a lucky audience whoever's going to be lucky participants you're going to, they're going to have i hope such... so they yeah. die laughing i'll tell you that <laughs> so we've got shars and next we're going to visit with nina and the notorious rbg hi yeah. she was crazy before but now she's uh just woke up she's, she's being she sweet a shark, but in fact, she ate the shark costume. And so now she's a butterfly because she can't reach that costume. <laughs> oh, that's better with the glasses. Now you're always paid against Ginsburg. <laughs> oh, wow. That's a fox. That's a fox. I'm, I'm guessing. A I came in my own character. It's a wild dog. Oh, it's a wild dog. Amazing. Wow, what a top. Have you ever worn that out? It's brilliant. <laughs> Do you have the whole costume or just the head? Not yet, he's on the way. <laughs> oh, it's just great. Wow. Hello. Hello. Uh, this is just my normal clothes with some horns. <laughs> <laughs> As you do. It's like what, bar or something. What is, do you, that, that's like a kind of demonic look. Yeah, it, it's a scarf that my partner got for me. Oh, so with cool. a hood, a bit impractical for everyday use. Yeah, you might get a few looks, but it's still great. It's just the horns, you know, during COVID and everything. But normally yeah. you'd be fine. <laughs> oh, he gave me a haircut as well to the side. Oh, wow. Yeah. Hello. 
Hello, it looks like the Mongolians and the Prussians. <laughs> I don't oh, know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we've, we've come as uh, Genghis Khan of the, uh, the Golden Horde and also von Bismarck. Um, <laughs> Fantastic. Things <laughs> every Halloween. Yeah. Yes. This, this, this is just boring for us. It's brilliant. It's really brilliant. Genghis the super abundance Khan. of hats. <laughs> Next, we have a spooky story from Geneva. My undergrad was Hanover College, which is a tiny gem of a liberal arts school on the very southern edge of Indiana overlooking the Ohio River. And right next to the overlook and crowning the quad sits Parker Auditorium, which is named for former college president Albert Parker. Parker Auditorium is a weird and beautiful death trap that has actually since been closed for student use because there were so many code violations. But when I was there, we just rolled with the fact that you had to climb on the circuit breaker to get into the catwalk <laughs> and it was fine. So Parker is actually listed on several haunted house sites because of the long held belief that Albert himself haunts the place. And when I first arrived, several of my friends had told me of their own experiences with him. Stairwells that suddenly got abnormally cold, the ghost light on stage flickering on and off in deliberate intervals, and a friend who was working late in the costume shop with her brand new CD and the CD player skipping on the lyrics, I think we're alone now. It was a running joke that whenever anything went awry, we would blame it on Albert. He even had his own room and I very deliberately have never been in it. So my sophomore year, I stayed on campus over a break because I was working as a stage manager on a theater production in the nearby town of Madison. I had a key to Parker because I was often a stage manager in the student productions and there was a washer and dryer in the dressing room that weren't coin based, unlike pretty much everything else on campus. So one night I hauled all of my laundry across campus to Parker and set myself up in one of the classrooms designed for film viewings to watch White Christmas for the very first time while my laundry was running. It was really late because it was after the show that I had been working on and it was break, which meant I was the only person not only in the building, but on that half of campus, surrounded by a forest, dropping down a hill into a river. In retrospect, not the smartest thing I've ever done. But at one point during the movie, I heard a banging and a clanging that meant either something was very wrong with the watch machine or something was very wrong in general. Since I'm definitely that white girl that's going to die in the first 15 minutes of the horror film, I went to check it out. In Parker, the classrooms and offices flank a hallway that runs into the prop shop and off of the prop shop branch the green room and the dressing room. Everything is underneath the auditorium itself, so it's a pretty creepy setup at night because you have to walk through or past pretty much everything. I went up the couple of stairs to the prop shop on my way to the dressing room where the machines were. And when I opened the door, the green room door across the way swung slightly open and slammed shut. And I thought, well, this is a drafty old building. Maybe that's right. And then the table saw off in the corner started to whine and the light flickered. Realizing that I was totally alone to face this and having heard that Albert was a bit of a bully who didn't like to be confronted, I stood in the shop and I yelled, knock it off, Albert. I'm too poor to deal with coin laundry and I'm too tired to deal with you. So let me finish my laundry and I promise I'll get out of your building. The light restored, the saw quieted, everything went back to normal. I finished the laundry, I finished the film and you better believe I have not done that since. Yes. Astonishing! Oh my goodness! How did you? How did you? How did you even have the wherewithal not to just scream? <laughs> not to just go crazy. I get kind of stupid when I'm scared and I run at the thing instead of running away from the thing. But they tell you not to do that in every <laughs> movie. <laughs> my dear Sid, this is why I'm the white girl that dies in the first fifteen minutes. <laughs> <laughs> That's just awesome! My goodness. There is, there are more things on, in heaven and earth, aren't there? Then <laughs> it's really true. Gosh, I don't know what I don't. I, it creeps me out just thinking about it. Whew. I love the the detail that she was watching White Christmas. 
Oh, oh wow. Hello. I am dressed as the most dramatic princess costume that I could assemble out of my existing collections of tiaras, jewelry, and ballet costumes with 45 minutes to put makeup on. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It was worth it. It's, you look absolutely amazing. You look Thank you. I'm very happy with it. <laughs> totally phenomenal. Hello. Hey there. Um, no. As sacrilegious as it is, I've gone as a Star Wars character, Grand Admiral Thrawn, and what I like about him is he uses culture's art to find weaknesses to defeat them. I'm also joined by two wild beasts here. Kieran, who are you? I am a raccoon. I chose a onesie because we aren't going trick-or-cheating, and I like raccoons. And I'm Kieran, also joined by Malcolm. You a cat. <laughs> you a cat. <laughs> I'm a cat. <laughs> That's fantastic, you guys. Oh, very nice. You very all nice. look great. I even the Star Wars is totally forgiven. <laughs> I'm definitely a loyalist, but I, I I say I would date Star Wars, but I would marry Star Trek. Uh, <laughs> Good idea. So I've got my canar, so we can all have some canar tomorrow later. And I left my Ractogeno cup at the car, so sorry about that. Uh, uh, and thank <laughs> you for doing this because wow. it really pushed me into. Uh, Finishing this, I grabbed a hoodie pattern and wanted something I could kind of wear outside without it looking like I was great. on my way to a con. And you, um, and you look great. It looks terrific. I, 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 can I ask you, have you come as Cisco? Are you Commander Cisco? I would never presume to be Cisco. Oh, well, you could, you could, you could pull it off. You got, you know, you got, you look good <laughs> yeah, in command. moving my hair. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Doctor, Mary. let me guess. <laughs> Tom Baker, too. It's my rendition of the fourth doctor, complete with 11 foot scarf, which is fantastic. Kind of screwdriver, and of course, jelly babies. <laughs> Have to get it working. Okay. Well, some, some days, um, most days, I am a regular old doctor, but uh, as well today, I'm the doctor. <laughs> Yeah, you're great. That's great, Ariel. <laughs> to give you a little bit about pumpkin carving, it's something that started way, way back in Ireland. It was part of the, uh, the Samhain Festival, where people would carve faces or even some other designs into turnips, typically, and put a light in it. And that was, some say it was to mimic uh, fairy spirits, some say it was to try to keep them away. But whatever the reason, it was a tradition that carried over to the U.S. when the Irish came over here. From there, it, uh, it differs. There are some stories that say uh, they just plain transitioned to pumpkins because it was what was available. Turnips were scarce and pumpkins were plentiful. There's, uh, there are other theories that say uh, since there is another thing called a jack-o'-lantern. It's the, uh, also called a will-o'-wisp. It's phosphorescent gas coming from marshy areas. And uh, they said that in those areas, it became uh, a prank the kids would pull. They would carve faces in somebody's pumpkin in their field and stick a candle in it and scare people. And they said it looked like the jack-o'-lanterns in the swamp. But uh, whatever the case, it's become a fun tradition, and even as far back as 1837, there's documented cases of pumpkin carving as we have it today. It's just a fun thing. Because in 1837, there's actually a publication that mentioned uh, a pub in the U.S. holding a pumpkin carving contest or turnip carving, whatever vegetable they could have at that point in time. And it's... Uh, it's uh, the name Jack Lantern typically is kind of attributed to an old Irish folktale. This guy, Jack, is a blacksmith. He's not the best guy in the world. And he ends up capturing the devil. And through one way or another, once they catches him up a tree, once they in his pocket, either way, the idea is he's forged an iron cross and tricks the devil into going near it, traps him, and makes him promise that he will never take his soul backfires. Jack dies. Heaven doesn't want him because he's still not a very good guy. Devil laughs at him and says, ah, hey, yeah, I promise you, you can't come in. Here, have this to light your way. Chucks a piece of coal at him. Jack carves the uh, turnip they had with him, sticks it in there, wanders the earth 
in his sleeves. It's like something from like a story interlude from a Tom Waits album. Pretty great. <laughs> but anyway, in America, we've taken it and run with it, and it becomes this big fun thing. And there's pumpkin carving kits, but I find that the best tools are hardware store stuff, like uh, drywall rasps and bits of bandsaw that you bend on the handles. And I found that making your own tools, if you really get into this, is a lot of fun. Like this is just Christmas tree mixed with some steel bristles from a street sweeper that passed by. <laughs> so. This is these are actually better than the the clay tools we find in the store because these are made from spring steel. The ones in the store are not. <laughs> but uh, that's just kind of the quick history of pumpkin carving. It's not that complex of a history. It's just kind of a fun one, and it's a good explanation as to why we feel the need to cut up vegetables and cram fire inside of it, and <laughs> usually hit it with a baseball bat at the end of the season because. That's, <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you, my friend. That's just, um, I, I was, um, cause I, I've always wanted to be able to carve pumpkins. Um, like the ones, I think you showed us the, 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 the ex uh, pictures that we saw. Uh, was it you? I think it was. It was. I, I had a few of those and uh, I think we have some of the, some photos of some of the ones that I carved over the years. Um, Cause they're just beautiful. I mean, really works of art, exquisite, amazing. Um, and that, and when you light them, and the thickness of the, the flesh that you, you you can change so that you can change the kind of the light effects and, and bring all kind that is so clever. And I just don't think I'd ever have the patience. It just it's amazing. Well, they're they're fun. Some of them uh, you can carve pretty quickly. Oh, that's what I did for a yes yeah, website called Britain Company. The <laughs> the Grady twin from The Shining. Yeah, wow. the, yeah, the lit pumpkins. If you don't cut all the way through, you just shave the skin off. Because once you get that outer rind, it's only a millimeter or two deep. The inner pumpkin meat is translucent, so light will pop right through that. Gosh, that's amazing. Wow. Well, thank you. Yeah, there's lit ones and there's a – yeah, that's the, the combination of the sculpted and the lit. That was a big pumpkin for that one. That was about a 70-pound pumpkin. <laughs> Wow, that's huge. I mean, that's uh, crazy. It's uh, really spooky. I mean, that's a, a demon, of obviously. Yeah, I, I love those. The Bower from the Lord of the Rings. Yeah, and also because I'm a massive Dark Crystal fan, too. I ended up carving a Chamberlain. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. This is just art on a pumpkin. And I, I love the fact that it, it's it's so temporary. I mean, it's you, it's just not going to last. And you put all that work in. It's like it ice. Is. It, it's, it's a very good lesson for me because I always wanted to sculpt something and then see how long it had it last. But pumpkins are great because it teaches you to not be precious about it. There's nothing you can do that'll keep it from not turning disgusting in two days. <laughs> this one is already disgusting. Uh, that's <laughs> yeah, I love that movie. <laughs> that one too. <laughs> but yeah, this one, you can see the seam on it because you can attach pumpkin to pumpkin. You can put toothpicks in it and dowel it together. But uh, one of the things that works really well is super glue. For okay. some reason, super glue bonds very well with pumpkin. Wow. So that I was going to ask, do you have, are you, because how do you find pumpkins that don't, because you're using, a, by the time you get into that, you, you've got seeds and everything. So you're really taking multiple pieces of the, the firm flesh and, and being creative with that. Oh yeah. Yeah, a lot of the time, it, you're taking pumpkins and sometimes using it as is, sometimes kind of transforming it, just seeing what you can build out of it just as a raw material. Wow, uh, it's awesome. always fun, always messy. <laughs> yeah, totally messy. Gotta be. <laughs> wow. I figured, yeah, I had to do, a, the Jim Hardar is just cool looking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Mad, Mad, uh, Mad Max fan, too. So. <laughs> or Mad Beethoven, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> it does look like <laughs> I'm gonna think that now every time I watch that movie <laughs> gosh I actually uh, brought a picture of that to a convention and got Michael Dorn to sign a photograph of that one <laughs> that's amazing and that one's just from Zelda <laughs> you must have like billionaires asking oh. you to 
do all their parties for them, all their Halloweens, because they just want it to be, it be that top of the line, that exquisite. They do to an extent. Like I, uh, I, I get like companies that'll have me do stuff like that. Uh, Disney hired me to do some promo stuff for New Mutants and uh, Google. Do you ever get like so close to finishing and go, oh, I just broke off the tooth, the the thing I cannot oh. afford to break off. Oh, constantly, constantly. There's a <laughs> That time where something snaps and it's three in the morning and you look at it and you've got 30 seconds to decide to kick it like a football off your second story balcony in your apartment <laughs> or to think, oh, no, no, I could super list, I could carve this and turn it this way and it'll be okay. Wow. <laughs> but this is ceramics this taught delicate. me that. Yeah, they're really delicate. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but like ceramics was great because it taught me that most of the time, if it's broken, it can be fixed in some way or another. Or even better, you change it and then tell everyone you did that on purpose and that you're so creative and wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I broke much because of the bird. <laughs> Magnificent cereal card box. <laughs> That's really cool. Really good. Judita is actually part of a larger group costume. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, magnets are fun. <laughs> and I had this all just lying around. <laughs> the seeds are puff paste fabric. <laughs> it's great. Boromir loves him some puff paint. Boromir as Saint Sebastian. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Through it, eh? <laughs> I didn't know I would see all my enemies right here. <laughs> <laughs> wait, uh, wait. I can't read. So. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I was really excited about this, and I had this for a little while ago, and it's the, my first time using it. <laughs> It's fantastic. You just had it on hand? I made it, like, I think three weeks ago, and um, just for fun, but I haven't finished it. So this is part of my brother's Kylo Ren costume. <laughs> yeah. Wait, I'm going to go back. <laughs> hey. Oh, wow. Look at that. It's an abra. I made that the wings. So amazing. Yeah. Had a lot of fun. And um, I have to, I have to have uh, Randy and Crow to thank for like walking me through how to make stuff. Oh, it's great! It's great. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, I'm actually Arwen. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm invisible. And this dress, even though you probably can't tell, it was made oh, bespoke for me when I was 15, and I can not fit into it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I barely got myself into it, so yeah, yeah. you're not going to see me moving my arms or It's anything. great. It's terrific. It's yeah. beautiful. <laughs> it's the Lord of the Rings. It's fantastic. It's really cool. I've got, um, this is like the cloak from the original makers from the film because I'm just that nerdy. <laughs> <laughs> you're in the right part of the world. I certainly am. You certainly are. After that, we're going over to Randy, who has promised us some spooky banjo. Hey, guys. Hey, Randy. Um, yeah, I have some spooky banjo songs, so I thought maybe I would play you guys some spooky banjo songs for Halloween. Please um, do. Before I do, I'll just, I'll get this out of the way first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, 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 no. There we go. Now nobody has to ask. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Let's go. <laughs> Oh. 
turn to red. I was born in the soul of misery, and I never had meaning. They just gave me a number when I was young. Got a long line of heartache, I carry it with. List of lies I've broken, reach from here to hell. And a battle of the wind's been blowing on my back. Pray you don't look, pray I don't look back. I was born in the soul of misery. Born in the soul of misery. <laughs> Thanks, Randy. Um, let's do a couple more costumes. Ooh. Hi, everyone. Thank you. I'm, I'm Nurse from Straight It Away, if you didn't recognize me. Oh, amazing. <laughs> a very cheap costume. It's really cute. It's fantastic. Thanks. Have you seen have you seen Spirited Away, Sid? No, I haven't, but I, I, I've, seen, I've seen the picture. I've seen the poster. The, 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 I recognize that that uh, feature, the, 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 the face. <laughs> Actually, Anna on Michael's computer and my oh, little daughter. <laughs> Anna, you look, um, wow. Both of you don't look well. <laughs> you look well. Yeah, I died. She's you been look, stitched up. You look fantastic. You really do. Gorgeous. Amazing. You've got stitches going all the way down your chest. They've taken you apart. She's actually Sally from A Nightmare Before Christmas, if you know the movie. I do know that movie. Yeah, the Tim Burton film. Wow. Exactly. That's and gorgeous. And she doesn't gorgeous. want to take it off. It's late at night here <laughs> and she, wants, she has to go to sleep, but she doesn't want to take it off. So I said, well, you can sleep with it. For now, <laughs> once that's a good cause because you look so good, and you've also spent so much time and effort. Both of you, you both look amazing. Uh, go over to Max, who we got a little preview of on Tuesday. Oh, oh yeah, but he's stepped it up a bit. He's stepped up the lighting. Mm -hmm. wow. uh, I just went boring and traditional. So, <laughs> so spooky. That is really cool. That's really beautiful. How are you lighting yourself? What What are you um, doing? I just have an angle poise lamp and a scarf over it just to mute it a bit. Wow, it's amazing. And, and are you wearing a mask or have you made yourself up? No, it's face paint. So That's beautiful, man. That really is really, really beautiful. That is so cool. That is, that's one of the scariest. <laughs> that's genuinely designed to give people palpitations, to, to make them frightened, and it's working really well. Well, it is Halloween, so. <laughs> it is, and you should. It's brilliant. Really gorgeous, mate. Okay, we're going to go over to Ryan, who has a spooky story for us. Only the 90s talk show kids would get my costumes, but I'm Sally Jesse Raphael today with a uh, story. <laughs> 
I am going to tell you about a house in Emporia, Kansas um, called Plum Place. Um, it is located at 224 East 6th Avenue. It's currently used as a women's shelter, but it was built in the 1870s by the Plum family, uh, Preston B. Plum and Carrie Plum, to be their family home. This is how it looks looked in 1910 when uh, Carrie still lived there with most of their children. They had six children. Preston died in 1891. He was a senator, a state senator, and he died um, not in the house, but we'll get to that in a minute. So, <laughs> so that's the house in 1910. This is the house, how it looks today. It is enormous. It is kind of a maze inside. Carrie kind of, um, some people say she kind of went off the deep end after Preston died, um, putting additions, adding on to the house and stuff. She connected the carriage home, which I don't have a picture of, to the main part of the house. And it's basically, it goes on forever. I mean, it, it, it takes up, I want to say four or five regular city blocks. Would you say that's right, Mel? I mean, it's, it's a pretty big. Here's Preston Plum and Carrie Plum. Carrie is, um, She's an interesting figure. After her husband died, like I said, she made the uh, all these additions to the house. Um, she would put the house, uh, let the house be used as a Red Cross hospital during the influenza epidemic in 1918. And then after she died, she wanted it to be used to help the women in the community. And that's how it's been used since then. It's probably no surprise that since it's been used for Things like flu pandemic, it's been there for such a long time. Um, some creepy things have been happening there and have been said to happen there. The Plum family had six children. One of them, his name was Thomas, died at the age of two in the house. And he's said to be one of the ghosts that haunts the house. And Mel, if you wanna to go to the, the next couple slides. A couple of years ago, I went to a ghost tour at Plum House. It was a fundraising event for the shelter. What we did was we followed around a ghost hunting uh, group called the Flint Hills Paranormal Group. And they use, you know, the EMP things and video tools. And these are screenshots from a video that I took. This was an orb, um, which is basically like a energy ball that you can kind of see float across the screen. It goes so quickly. It is gone in a matter of seconds, but it basically made a diagonal line across the screen. It wasn't something that I saw when I was taking the video. It was something I saw when I was looking back at my pictures and videos later. So it was kind of an interesting thing. And the reason I mentioned Tommy there was because we were, we identified two figures there. There was a, an adult and kind of a childlike ghost. And we think we might've been talking to him. Here is another area where we were trying to communicate with some spirits. In the window, you can see a reflection of someone who was not in the room with us. <laughs> At first, when I saw it, I was like, oh, well, that's a, that's a reflection of Brandy, who's the woman in the black shirt there. But then I realized that didn't make any sense because it was a basically like a mirror image of how she would have been sitting. Like that's not how reflections work. <laughs> so I thought, oh, that kind of looks like Carrie Plum. If you look kind of close, if you squint, um, I tried to play with it a little bit. The clothing, I don't know. She spent a lot of time out there in the living area. And then the next photo is the wide shot. So you can see that there was nobody in that room that would have been sitting that way. And you can see the orb that I circled there, which is where that ghostly figure in the window is reflected. Ryan, is that your mom in the yellow? It is my mom in the yellow, yes. What's she holding? Those are dowsing rods. Those were things that we were using to communicate. We would ask yes or no questions. And they they seem fairly, like I, I, pretty skeptical when it comes to this kind of stuff. Um, I definitely believe, um, I went in there with an open mind. I believe in spirits. I believe in, you know, different kind of energies and stuff. Um, I wasn't really sure that I would have any kind of contact or anything, but the dowsing rods were interesting. They move, but 
it's kind of hard to make the move on your own. <laughs> so when my mom started holding them, they were sticking straight out in front of her. And then we were asking questions and they just started like turning and it was kind of weird. So another figure that is, uh, that I did encounter during my um, thing there is, there's a ghost cat at the house. They have cats there now. The cat that haunts, we don't know who it is, but this is not my picture when I was trying to take a picture of the ghost cat because I saw the light reflecting in my camera. This is from the basement in the very large creepy house. My camera that was working perfectly fine stopped working. <laughs> it just stopped. I had um, full battery. I tried um, using my backup battery. I changed out the battery. Same wow. thing, wasn't working. Um, as soon as we left the room, camera started working again. Wow. So, ghost cat. <laughs> yeah, my goodness. I wonder, I've got a theory that I don't know. I know that I've never felt anything or seen anything or anything like that, And but I've met m many people who do. And obviously there are millions of people over time who have seen and felt and, and been had some experiences. And, I'm not a superstitious person. I've got to rationalize everything. You know, that's just the way it goes. Um, and I just wonder if we're just not very familiar with time, what time is, how it works. And what we're doing is kind of, I mean, it's, it's different. It's, it, my theory kind of runs aground when you've got a group of five people in the same room and they're all experiencing the same thing. But it seems to me that if time is slippery, then you might be seeing something happening, a real person doing something in an, from another time, just a routine movement. Because uh, often people say, you know, this this person gets up and walks over and jumps out of the window, or this person gets up and sits on the end of my bed. There's never an interaction of any real consequence, but there's a repetition of movement that people see again and again. And I just wonder, maybe you're peeking into another time and seeing actually someone doing something. Does that, does that ring a bell with you? Yeah, so um, I don't know if you watched the um, the Haunting of Hill House that Netflix put out um, the first season. Um, there's a line at the very end of it where one of the characters said that um, life really isn't linear. Um, it's really like confetti. Yeah. Um, like time kind of falls around us like confetti, like everything happens. And I really kind of feel like that um, that is true in a lot of cases. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, there's I, room for everything, isn't there? There's room for pretty yeah. much. Uh, you know, especially, especially like the whole, and even, even, um, uh, if you look into like the whole, um, without getting too crazy <laughs> into the, you know, uh, like the mandala effect and stuff um and uh you know parallel universes and stuff where yeah yeah know, yeah if we, it's not crazy um, suddenly fell into the wrong universe or whatever yeah and, um, it might be beyond our imagination but it's certainly not crazy i'm i'm very careful never to think of anybody as crazy anymore because <laughs> that is just not the thing and uh, just different but wow Okay, that's really cool. I'm, I'm amazed about that. I wish I could see something. I'd be happy with a ghost cat. I'd, I'd settle for a ghost cat. Pokemon. <laughs> we went to the Winter Wonderland in Hyde Park last year and did very well on the fairground. So, like... Oh my goodness, how many times did you play that game? <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I have a very weak throw, which apparently is what you need. Like, you just, yeah, like, so it did very well. I am Giovanni from Pokemon for tonight. Nice to meet you, Giovanni from Pokemon. Awesome. That's really cool. And over your Pokemon to me. <laughs> <laughs> Emma, I, I see you had some Pokemon, so give them to me. I have Mewtwo now. <laughs> I'm invincible. Oh, yeah. That's really great. I used to play the game on the Nintendo Game Boy, the handheld thing. Catch, catch, the, catch them all. I don't know if you ever got to play that. It was really cool. I, I have, I have a couple of those games on emulator. Yeah, they're good. They're really fun. I think we have a doctor in the house. Another doctor. Ah, yes, I'm a generic space doctor. Uh, yes. Okay, these are things I had lying around. <laughs> uh, 
This is a uh, like little transparent heads up display thing I've been Oh yeah, last that's really year, cool. I can see that. Yeah. Uh, for a hacker thing in wow. LA. That's, cool. <laughs> that's so, yeah. really cool. Hi, Valentina. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Good to see you. I know that costume. You that's too. really cool. See, <laughs> your, your costume is amazing. Thank you. you shaved your beard for us. Yes, I did. <laughs> okay, so I, I'm a niner. You look oh, fantastic. Thank you. you and then also okay. I have a baseball glow. Yes. Globe, I have this, I've, uh, I've had this for years because I've always been fascinated by baseball, even though in Italy it's not so popular. And that's um, a custom made uh, baseball, the replica of the one uh, from the head, so with your signature. Yeah. Is yeah. On it. Uh, my friend uh, Kellan did it. Uh, we met. Uh, we met on Twitter. Oh. Hi. <laughs> Hi. So I'm a character from the classical Russian fairy tales. I'm the most hospitable granny in all the Russian forests. Oh, you look great! Oh my goodness! And what what would you say you were? Is it a witch? No, I, I'm not a witch. I'm I'm just Baba Yaga. I'm not okay. a witch. <laughs> I've heard of Baba Yaga. Absolutely. Yeah. And I've... this broom is a unique tool. You can cook with it like this. So you can ride it. So everything. It's perfect. Okay. So from the haunting of Middle America to the haunting of Treasure Island, Colin's up next. Ooh. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, well, this concerns somebody you've actually met when you were working in Manchester. He's uh, one of um, Paul's best mates, Michael Clark. I don't know if you remember him at all. Oh, yeah. Right? Rings a bell. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. He's very charismatic. Anyway, we were doing this production of Treasure Island and um, we were set on an island off the coast of Liverpool and it was a promenade production and we did everything around the island and the audience would walk out to the island at low tide. And then uh, we, they'd have their picnic. And by the time they'd finished the picnic, the tide would be in and they would be on Treasure Island. And we would start the play. And we lived on the island in the rangers' huts. And uh, there was no electricity, so it was all candlelight and torchlight. And uh, one night there was a massive storm. I mean, it had to be a massive storm, but this is all completely true. And uh, we were sat around, we were playing little games like uh, putting cards down and trying to guess which card somebody would turn their back and guess which card uh, someone had picked by pointing and you point at the, ang uh, the direction of the card and that's how you get that trick. Anyway, while we were doing it, my Michael told us this story how he'd, um, he'd been at a party and his car uh, was blocked in and uh, he couldn't get out. So he went back into the party and he said, oh, uh, someone's got this car, it's blocking my part and uh, my car, can you move it? And this girl said, oh, it's my car here, I'll take the keys, you move it. And she threw the keys and he caught the keys and he said, as he caught them, he had these like flashes of uh, like photographs of, of like her in different situations. And he went out and he moved the car and he went back in and he gave her the keys. And he said, is this going to sound really strange? But he said, do you know somebody who looks like and he described this person? And she went, oh, yeah, that's my dad. And he was like, oh, and, and do you know this person? And he described another person that he'd seen a flash of in the in the photos. And she got she got really freaked out because she didn't know him. And he didn't think anything of it. So we said, oh, this could be great. So uh, how about if I give you my ring um, and my, that my grandfather had? And I'll give you my ring and see if you get anything from that. And he sat there and he was taking swigs and it took quite a long time. But he was sort of sort of saying, um, yeah, I can see I can see a, a sort of old couple and um, they live in a, a house, but it's not quite a house and it's near water. And I can see cats. And um, and I know about cold reading. I know how to, you know, this. I'm very sceptical about this. So I just was sitting there going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the only thing I said to him was, have you got any names? Does any, any names spring to mind? And he said, um, yeah, uh, Margaret, Margaret and John and Bill. Bill, but, well, Margaret and John and Bill, but not Bill, not Bill, but Margaret and John and Bill. I was, right. And I was freaking out at this point, thinking, OK, this is really interesting. And then he said, and now I see somebody else, a sort of another old man, and he's surrounded by dogs, by greyhounds, and he's carving little wooden figures in the shed. 
And so I stopped him and I said, okay, I said, this is really interesting for me. I said, because that ring was my grandfather's ring and he gave it to my aunt and uncle to look after until I was 18 when it came to me. And you seem to have gone back in time, funny you were saying that, with the ring because my aunt and uncle who had the ring were called Rita and Jock, but their actual names are Margaret and John. And their surname is Birrell, which isn't Bill, but it's about as close as you could get. And he was going, it's Bill, but not Bill. And I said, and they live in a bungalow, which has been converted. So it's not quite a bungalow. It's not quite a house. And they live by a lock and they don't have children and they only have cats. I said about my, my grandfather, though, I said, you seem to have then described my grandfather. I haven't I never met my grandfather. I have no idea if he ever had dogs or carved wooden figures. I said, but my mom is coming to see the play tomorrow and um, I'll ask her. And she turned up and I, first thing I said to her, I said, mom, this is gonna sound really strange, but did, did your dad ever own any type of dog at all? And she said, yeah, he used to race and breed greyhounds. I was like, what? How, I, I didn't even know this. And I'm thinking, this is just freaking. And, um, and she said, but she didn't even know about the carving wooden figures. And then we got another guy to give him his keys. And he started doing this reading about Frank and Betty and being in a hospital, but not for the, he was, had a wooden leg in an old bath chair. And he was in hospital, not for, for the leg, but he had, um, he had something else. And everybody in the hospital had the same thing. And Tony, whose keys it was, was like, no, nah, doesn't know, don't know, no idea who that is at all. And Johnny Moran, another actor in the company, at the back of the room suddenly said, that's my mum and dad. And we were all like, what? He said, that's my mum and dad. My mum's my mom's Betty and my dad's Frank. And they met in a hospital just after the war. He was in the tuberculosis hospital and he broke his leg and she was his nurse. And we were like, hang on, how did you get that from Tony's keys? So Johnny gave him his keys. And as soon as he grabbed them, Michael just freaked out and was like, I, I, no, I, I don't want to do that. No, I don't know. I'm not, I've done now. I've done enough now. And we were all a bit sort of freaked out by that. And we just sort of went, okay, fair enough. And sadly, three weeks later, Johnny's dad died. And oh. we were just like, this is, it's, it's the only thing in my life, literally the only thing in my life that has ever genuinely spooked me out. And I am utterly skeptical of everything. Yeah. But the fact that I didn't know about my grandfather racing and breeding greyhounds, and he described that to me about wow. my he could see it i was just like well this is just crazy and you met him michael clark you met him yeah. up in manchester he's yeah. one of Paul's best. so there you go that's my speaker story of the evening and now i will move on and disappear i dressed as my dentist basically that's what i've come as so oh right that's what he looks like is it yeah or, or to me that's what my dentist looks like so i thought i would just show you <laughs> what it feels like to have a phobia about dentists and this is it's it. really cool that's really good there you go all right so, see you later see you. matey see you later mate <laughs> bye <laughs> Giving me the creeps, everybody. Hi, doctor. <laughs> you took me off. It's really terrific. It's great. Nice. That's okay. so cool. We're good. So much better presented than the actual doctors that we played. <laughs> oh, we've got an evil swan. Oh my goodness. Is that Hello. A I'm an evil swan. That is so creepy. <laughs> Great. That is so cool. Yeah, I got the mask. I'd love it. It's a beautiful mask. It's creepy. Yeah, someone's out. asking on the chat, is it a mask from Sleep No More? And yes, it is. Ah. Um, we're going to a secret agent next. Nobody tell. <laughs> this year, Julie, this year. Oh, yes. <laughs> and I also have the little mini spy gun. That's fantastic. That is so awesome. Uh, gosh, I wish I could find, where's Ash? Oh, we have someone, <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm, I'm Wally. Yeah, that's really cool, <laughs> we found you. <laughs> I'm the silver fox. Oh, yes. Remember, remember this? Fantastic. Oh, I'm that's great. Okay, we've got another scary story coming to us from Rob. Hello. So there's a thing called EVP, which is electronic voice uh, phenomenon, which I was not really familiar with when all this happened. 
we spoke predicated all with that. Um, so anyway, my, my dad died in September of 2002. And uh, the night of the wake, um, I was absolutely exhausted because I was, my, I was pretty much helping my mom with everything and just running around and I was like exhausted. So I was, you know, I went to bed early, I was out like a light. And then um, the apartment I lived in at the time, I had an answering machine, but it never really worked. So what would happen is the phone would ring, it'd say, please leave a message. You'd leave a message and I'd never hear anything or it would, you know, just, it just didn't take messages, right? Um, so anyway, I'm asleep and I just remember, I literally remember just going from like sleep to being like sitting up straight at like the drop of a hat. Um, and I banged my arm, which is kind of why I remember that it was 325. But um, I heard about two minutes of static on my answering machine with something underneath it that sounded like a voice or a conversation or something. And um, it was very weird. I'm trying to like, hello, hello, hello. I, I don't hear anything, right? So I gave up. Then for the next three nights, roughly around the same time frame. I kept hearing this like static. It would be like if you were talking in short sentences, there'd be static, 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 pause, lots of static, feedback, noise, all this stuff, right? And then the final night, the phone rings, I'm like, oh my God, what is this? You know, and I had other calls um, on my phone where I've talked to people. So I knew my phone was working. But the last night, I remember being, you know, asleep and I it was the night after his funeral. I remember um, hearing the phone ring. So I, I, I get up. And I, I didn't quite get to the phone, but then I hear my, my dad's voice telling to me, um, clear as day, and I can still remember it, you know, you know, hey, Rob, it's dad, just want to let you know, I'm proud of you, take care of your mom, it's going to be okay, you know, and it just completely freaked me out, like the next day, I was like numb, right, um, it was just really weird, and um, so then two years ago, my mom died, and you know, I'm, I'm asleep and the same thing happened. My phone, this time we have a, you know, cause I'm married and I have somebody who's smarter than me. We have an answering machine that actually works and that. So my phone rings and um, I wake up and I hear the static again, like static, 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 talk, 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 static with like, it would almost be like if this was like a, you know, it's like if you're on a bad walkie talkie or something. Right. Yeah. And it was like, four nights in a row there were like three short messages but they were this time they could leave the messages like i could i could play back the messages on the voicemail right and i play them back and i just hear, heard static so that you know it kept happening then the last night um there's all the static and then i hear this voice and i and my mom had this very sort of soft mellow voice and i just remember hearing this very calming voice just saying oh my boy, oh my boy, and then lots of static, right? And I, it just completely sent chills down me. And, you know, since that time, from like November of 2018 to like late last year, I knew somebody pretty much peripherally or close friends that had passed away, right? And nobody else had this happen to them. So, and I didn't think this was much of anything. And then, you know, I have a friend of mine who's like, oh, have you heard of EVP? And I'm like, oh yeah. And then I remember when the last night when my mom, when I was t when my mom called, um, it was weird because the TV in the living room like flicked on and off like twice. It would like it was just weird. So that's that is wow. my Halloween story. Um, that, yeah. yeah, absolutely. But it is apparently a thing. I've done. I've talked to some people about it. It is apparently a really big thing. What is how do you, what is the acronym for again? EVP. Um, electronic voice phenomenon. So it's the idea that you can use answering machines, televisions, radios, anything with like an electronic signal yeah. to speak with someone. And right. apparently, from what from what I've heard, it is this belief that for a short short period after someone has passed, they can use media to try to communicate with loved ones. But it's, there's like they believe the people that have studied this and I don't know how much whether how legitimating this is or not but from what I've understood it's a it's a very short window of time it'll happen three or four nights or five or six days or whatever and then it, you don't hear from it again yeah. um and the, you know my voicemail works clear as day which is just weird um totally weird hi hi 
I am Loxana Troy, daughter of the fifth house, holder of the you... sacred palace of rings, and heir to the holy rings of fate. Is it? Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> you are brilliant, Roxana Troy. Fantastic. Thank you for the Bowie song. I liked it very much. Ah, uh, you know, it's about time I gave some some a song back, even though you know it's not my thing. But mm. I'm really glad to to have a go, and I make people sing for me, so I'm really happy to do it back. You look fantastic, by the way. You Thank really you. I made good. this myself. It, we can't really see it, but it looks. I'm sure it's great. I can see, there you go. I saw That's this brilliant. fabric. I saw this fabric, and I thought, Loxana. That's going to be. Yeah, amazing, really cool. Hey, Rachel. Uh, hi, I was supposed to be Deanna Troy because this onesie is the most comfortable thing I own. <laughs> that's the idea. Well, that's sensible. So, Form yeah, first. but uh, the person playing like my mother earlier obviously put a lot more work into it, but <laughs> I've been doing work around the house. So I just. Oh, I know. It looks great. It looks, look, it looks comfy. And I don't, I can't tell where you're at. Is that one of the sets? It's, yeah, it's supposed to be ten forward. The like ah. bar, yeah. Ah, okay. Nice, really cool. Um, I, have, cool. I have some chocolate too, which is in character. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she, it's brilliant. It's really good, and, like, <laughs> and we love it. We love all these Star Trek guys coming in. Mm -hmm. so, well, really good. Terrific. We've got two more incoming: Lisa and Kira. Oh my goodness. That's no. amazing. Is that a salamander? There's <laughs> some alien. You've been alien. carried away by the aliens. The alien. You're being abducted by an alien. <laughs> quick, quick, call the police. Call the police. She doesn't oh, seem too unhappy about it. Maybe they're mates. What? Maybe they're good old friends. <laughs> Hello. Awesome. These yeah, are such, I, all these costumes are so well made. This, this is basically just painted onto it. Really? I couldn't I could not have told you that. I mean I would not have known. That's amazing. Awesome. Yes, I can see now. That's really brilliant. <laughs> really, really good done. Really well done. This is my trike order, which I made when I was eight. But I got my, Michael Moore, who did the props on Voyager to sign it, but forgot oh. to tell him. Forgot to tell him that I made it when I was eight. Oh. So he looked at me like. It looks good. It doesn't look like an eight year old made it. <laughs> it looks great. So I'm a, I'm just dressed as a trill, not any particular one. Although I did wear my cork shirt. Um, oh, but I also, I have a symbiont. Oh, yeah. This is like a, I bought this on Etsy. It's like a plushy version of the one you pulled out of Jadzia that in that one episode. genuinely Halloween revolting. <laughs> with a certificate yes indeed about the symbiont <laughs> signed by Esri that's brilliant that's really cool <laughs> yeah I, I wanted to go as a trill because today is the 20th 5th anniversary of Rejoined airing right right so that's good day cool. to be a trill really good day to be a trill <laughs> <laughs> it's brilliant you're brilliant thank you very much <laughs> indeed. I don't think anybody's supposed to know what this is it's Pretty astonishing. It looks like well, like it's, it's it actually looks Doctor Who. It's uh, there's the, the, there were the sea creature type dudes. Can't remember what they were called. But that's uh, sure. um, I know uh, when I got it, it was listed as the uh, the demon Belial. Wow, it's brilliant. Mel kindly picked out a story, and um, I'm gonna David's gonna have to put on his glasses. Because uh, uh, he can't see. Uh, and it's called um, Click Clack, The Rattle Bag by Neil Gaiman. And I'll try and do it as Bowie, although you probably won't notice the difference. Um, right. Before you take me up to bed, will you tell me a story? Do you actually need me to take you up to bed? I asked the boy. He thought for a moment, then with intense seriousness, yes, actually I think you do. It's because of, I've finished my homework and so it's my bedtime and I'm a bit scared. Not very scared, just a bit. 
but it is a very big house and lots of times the lights don't work and it's sort of dark. I reached over and tussled his hair. I can understand that, I said. It is a very big old house, he nodded. We were in the kitchen where it was light and warm. I put down my magazine on the kitchen table. What kind of story would you like me to tell you? Well, he said, thoughtfully, I don't think it should be too scary because then when I go up to bed, I will just be thinking about monsters the whole time. But if it isn't just a little bit scary, then I won't be interested. And you make up scary stories, don't you? I know she says that's what you do. She exaggerates. I write stories, yes. Nothing that's been published yet. And I write lots of different kinds of stories. But you do write scary stories. Yes. The boy looked up at me from the shadows by the door where he was waiting. Do you know any stories about Click Clack the Rattle Bag? I don't think so. Those are the best sorts of stories. Do they tell them at school? He shrugged. Sometimes. What's a Click Clack the Rattle Bag story? He was a precocious child and was unimpressed by his sister's boyfriend's ignorance. You could see it on his face. Not everybody knows them. But I don't, I said, trying not to smile. He looked at me as if he was trying to decide whether or not I was pulling his leg. He said, I think maybe you should take me up to my bedroom and then you can tell me a story before I go to sleep. But not a very scary story because I'll be up in my bedroom then and it's actually a bit dark up there too. I said, Shall I leave a note for your sister telling her where we are? You can, but if but you'll hear when they get back, the front door is very slammy. We walked out of the warm and cosy kitchen into the hallway of the big house where it was chilly and drafty and dark. I flicked the light switch, but nothing happened. The bulb's gone, the boy said. That always happens. Our eyes adjusted to the shadows. The moon was almost full and blue white moonlight shone in through the high windows on the staircase, down into the hall. We'll be all right, I said. Yes, said the boy soberly. I'm very glad you're here. He seemed less precocious now. His hand found mine and he held onto my fingers comfortably, trustingly, as if he'd known me all his life. I felt responsible and adult. I did not know if the feeling I had for his sister, who was my girlfriend, was love, not yet, but I liked that the child treated me as one of the family. I felt like his big brother. And I stood taller. And if there was something unsettling about the empty house, I would not have admitted it for all the world. The stair stairs creaked beneath the threadbare carpet. Click clacks, said the boy, are the best monsters ever. Are they from television? I don't think so. I don't think any people know where they come from. Mostly they come from the dark. Good place for a monster to come. Yes. We walked along the upper corridor in the shadows, walking from patch of moonlight to patch of moonlight. It really was a big house. I wish I had a flashlight. They come from the dark said the boy, holding onto my hand. I think probably they're made of dark and they come in when you don't pay attention. That's when they come in. And then they take you back to their not nests. What's a word that's like nests, but not? House? No, it's not a house. Um, lair? He was silent then I think that's the word, yes, lair. He squeezed my hand, he stopped talking. Right, so they take the people who don't pay attention back to their lair. And what do they do then, your monsters? Do they suck all the blood out of you like vampires? He snorted, vampires don't suck all the blood out of you. They only drink a little bit. 
just to keep them going and, you know, flying around. Click clacks are much scarier than vampires. Well, I'm not scared of vampires, I told him. Me neither. I'm not scared of vampires either. Do you want to know what click clacks do? They drink you, said the boy. Well, like a Coke. Coke is very bad for you, said the boy. If you put a tooth in Coke in the morning, it will be dissolved into nothing. That's how bad Coke is for you and why you must always clean your teeth every night. I'd heard the Coke story as a boy and had been told as an adult that it wasn't true, but was certain that a lie which promoted dental hygiene was a good lie and I let it pass. Click clacks drink you, said the boy. First they bite you and then you go all ishy inside and all the meat and all your brains and everything except your bones and your skin turns into a wet, milk shaky stuff and then the click clack sucks it out through the holes where your eyes used to be. Well, that's disgusting, I told him. Did you make it up? We'd reached the last flight of stairs all the way into the big house. No. I can't believe you kids make up stuff like that. You didn't ask me about the rattle bag, he said. Right, what's the rattle bag? Well, he said eagerly, sagely, soberly, a small voice from the darkness beside me. Once you're just bones and skin, they hang you up on a hook and you rattle in the wind. So what do these click clacks look like? Even as I asked him, I wish I could have taken the question back and leave it unasked, I thought. Huge spidery creatures like the one in the shower that morning. I'm afraid of spiders. I was relieved when the boy said, well, they look like what you're, what you're not expecting, what you aren't paying attention to. We climb the wooden steps now. I held onto the railing on my left, held his hand with my right as he walked beside me. It smelled like dust and old wood that high in the house. The boy's tread was certain, though, even though the moonlight was scarce. Do you know what story you're going to tell me to put me to bed, he asked. It doesn't actually have to be scary. Uh, not really. Maybe you could tell me about this evening. Tell me what you did. That won't make much of a story for you. My girlfriend just moved into a new place on the edge of town. She inherited it from an aunt or someone. It's very big and very old. I'm gonna spend my first night with her tonight. So I've been waiting for an hour or so for her and her housemates to come back with the wine and an Indian takeaway. See, said the boy. There was that precocious amusement again, but all kids can be insufferable at times. When they think they know something you don't, it's probably good for them. You know all that, but you don't think. You just let your brain fill the gaps. He pushed open the door to the attic room. It was perfectly dark now, but the opening door disturbed the air and I heard things rattle gently like dry bones in thin bags in the slight wind click. Clack, click, clack, like that. I would have pulled away then if I could, but small, firm fingers pulled me forward unrelentingly into the dark. That was written by the brilliant Neil Gaiman, and it's called Click Clack, the Rattle Bag. Oh my gosh. I picked that one and I'm freaking out. <laughs> Very well done. Thank you. Very nicely done. Okay. Well, on that incredibly creepy, spooky note, we're going to wrap up our Halloween party. I saw all of you in the chat going, no, it's the kid, run. <laughs> oh, thanks to Nana, who was here earlier and told us a spooky story of her own. 
Um, thanks to Rob and Geneva and James and Randy and Ryan and Colin, who all came and shared spooky stories. And of course, thank you to Sid for that delightfully creepy reading. Thank you. And thank you for organizing all this with everybody, with the group. Well, a huge thank you goes to Shar. Um, she yeah. worked with me over the last week or so to help come up with ideas and put this all together. And I couldn't have done it without her. So thank you, Shar. I really appreciate it, even though this is her busiest week of the year. My pleasure. It was great seeing yeah, you. Yeah, it's a Happy big Halloween. deal, Shar. We're indebted to you. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. I'm glad I could share Halloween with all of you. So yeah. happy Halloween, everybody. Lots of happy love. Halloween. I'm going to try and get it off my face. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween.